All right, hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm super excited. We have a really great session for you guys. We have McKesson here, who's one of the largest companies in the world, who's going to talk about their identity strategy and unifying onto a single identity standard. And from McKesson, we have Spencer Mott, who's the SVP and Chief Information Security Officer. And we have Andy Zitney, who's SVP and Chief Technology Officer for McKesson. As Arlene mentioned, I'm Lindsay Bly. I'm on the product strategy team here at Okta. Um, and I'm super excited to share with, uh, with you guys what we have today. Before we get started, I want to give a little bit of context around why this discussion is so important and why we need to talk about it now. So if you've bought anything online in the past few years, you know that digital experiences are redefining customer engagement and, and expectations. And what do I mean by that? Think about the last time you bought something on Amazon instead of going down to the grocery store. Or think about the last time you bought something on Macy's or Nordstrom.com just to avoid the experience of having to go to the mall and having to go through all that hassle. I even recently bought a car online, a used car. The experience was seamless and beautiful from a company called Shift. It was delivered to my house, and they even did the DMV paperwork. And that was so amazing that I'll probably never step foot in a dealer again. Now, the challenges with creating these digital experiences are that digital transformations are not easy, especially for large organizations that have been around for many years and who have grown substantially through mergers and acquisitions. And we see three common things kind of holding up these digital transformations. And one is a skills gap. Now, you all know that developers are not easy to come by, and these digital transformations require a host of developers to execute. The second is agility. A lot of these more mature organizations have systems and processes and infrastructure that have been around for years that aren't necessarily ready to support rapid innovation. And the last is scale. As these organizations are able to create wonderful digital experiences, it's one thing to do that for a couple thousand daily active users. But when you start talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of daily active users, creating and maintaining and managing for that scale becomes resource and cost prohibitive. And at the root of this problem are legacy identity systems. These legacy identity systems were not made to support the modern omni-channel experiences that customers expect today. And getting them, trying to force them to do so creates downstream impacts, like time to market delays, poor customer experiences resulting in abandonment, exorbitant costs of total cost of ownership, and lastly, unfortunately, security vulnerabilities that lead to data breaches. And that's why we believe that at the core of every successful digital transformation is a single secure identity service. This should underpin all of your experiences and also provide a layer of security across the platform. And this single identity service should be developer friendly so that your team really actually wants to use it and they're not off using their own system. It should come with pre-built code and custom workflows so that your developers can focus on the challenging customization aspects of your digital transformation and not building out the basic infrastructure that you could get elsewhere. And secondly, it should come with built-in security, things like granular security policy, out-of-the-box workflows for common use cases, and integrations for best-of-breed security solutions, again, so that your developer team can focus on what matters to your customers and not trying to build out a security platform. And with that, I'll hand it off to Andy and Spencer, who are going to walk through the McKesson identity strategy and talk more about why a single identity standard is an imperative to support this strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Actually, I just noticed these are the six foot and over chairs, because if you're under six foot, you just swing your legs like <laughs> that. Swing. Time. Yeah. All right. Um, so delighted to be here. My name is Spencer Mott. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at McKesson. Andy? Uh, I'm Andy Zitney. I'm the Chief Technical Officer for McKesson. Very good. So uh, I won't spend a, a lot of time just framing the company and what we do, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're one of the largest healthcare companies. We're one of three in the Fortune 10. And uh, we've been around for a little while, actually, for around about 180-odd uh, years. Um, so actually, if you start right at the very beginning, uh, 1833, we were a business that was uh, operating off a handcart and off the back of a wagon, and uh, we used to sell botanical uh, therapeutics. Uh, so it was kind of plant-based uh, medicines and drugs um, into local population, and kind of fast forward to present day today, uh, we're, as I say, one of the largest companies, and we touch just about every part of the healthcare ecosystem, uh, I would say bar insurance. So we've got a core business that's built around um, distribution of, uh, of medicine and medical supplies. 
and that's into hospitals, pharmacies, uh, doctors, physicians, clinics, etc. Um, what I would say is uh, our environment is rapidly changing, I've been, and I mean the healthcare environment, as you probably all realise. And uh, a lot of that change is being driven by consumer expectations, as Lindsay uh, alluded on, and uh, the fact that most consumers now want to uh, experience and interact with their health journey in a similar way to they conduct other kind of transactional business and, uh, and buy goods and services. Uh, so we have a number of pressures on the healthcare system. Apart from the ones you see on the slide there, I would just say that we have an environment where many of the pieces of the healthcare systems don't naturally kind of work together. And, uh, and that's something I'll touch on a little bit later when we talk about the decision uh, around Opta. So a big company, you know, nearly 80,000 employees, uh, can, you know, generating a lot, a lot of cash. Uh, but to generate that cash, we really operate as a company of many companies, uh, a global presence, uh, kind of 14 odd uh, countries in Europe, as well as uh, our North America operation. And um, we, as Andy mentioned earlier, actually, is that most of the drugs that you kind of uh, procure over the counter or, or administer, one in three of them would have uh, come through the McKesson supply chain. So if you go to your doctor's uh, surgery, you'll probably see our products uh, on the wall with the little M. Okay, so our, you know, kind of business proposition really starts by putting the uh, patient at the center. And I mentioned before this kind of consumer-driven transformation that's going to occur in healthcare. And uh, many of our partners are in those segments that I mentioned before, uh, but what's driving a, a kind of coalition within that group is really how do you serve patients' needs better, and patients in, patient in the broader sense, so we, you know, not only through illness or, or some other occurrence, not only dealing with the patient, we're also dealing with their families and the carers and the people that treat them, so it's a pretty big uh, group when we think about that persona. So to do that and reinvent, if you like, the way that we uh, conduct our business and actually be a lot more intimate with our you know, consumer base and patients, we've really had to go through a journey of how do you reinvent you know, a, a, a business that's over 180 years old? And how do you move from that handcart wagon experience right the way through to what's really been over the last 20 odd years, which is really a technology business or components of our business that are very much driven by technology. And each of our segments, we see technology today actually playing uh, a kind of forefront role, whether it's robotics in our distribution supply chain, uh, sensors that help with you know, distribution of specialist drugs, uh, but also as we think about you know, workforce productivity and that engagement piece through various kind of um, web, web interactions with, with, our, uh, with our partners and customers. So you know, customer-centric model straight up front, you know, shared value system, one that's kind of agnostic to all those different competing priorities within healthcare, and then innovation and transformation driving a lot of that uh, productivity. So Andy, as our CTO, is going to talk a little bit about you know, what that infrastructure looks like and the technology stack uh, that leads to some of those decisions around uh, choosing Okta as a partner. Andy? Thank you. Um, so I'll briefly give you a little overview of the technology stack and sort of our environment. Um, really want to focus on where, we're, where we are right now or previously. We're right in the middle of the transformation. So if you think about it, McKesson's grown through acquisitions for years, right? 180 years plus of acquisitions probably. We, not a lot of integration on those. Um, a lot of operating them separately. So what you're seeing here is we have 22 data centers uh, around the globe. We're in you know, 15 different countries. Each one of those data centers probably have different solutions in them for, throughout the whole stack, not just identity, but throughout the entire technology stack. To deliver a product in that and try and create a seamless uh, customer experience is almost impossible. Um, so coming in three years ago, where we took a look at the, I'll say the legacy environment and started to think about, okay, so where, where should we head? What should our technology stack look like? And we had, I'll say, headwinds in the industry, transformation in the industry from outside, not, not our normal competitors, right? Everybody talks about Amazon entering. I think they enter everything. Um, they're competitors to everybody, right? So that's not your normal healthcare provider. Um, startups are starting to come into this space. So the complexity of not just our technology being legacy technology, the complexity of the landscape of healthcare is an industry changing. Um, created a perfect storm, uh, gave us the, the, I'll say the, the 
burning platform to say, hey, we have to, our products have to look and feel a lot different. So that's why we kicked off the sort of the IT transformation. So um, at the end of my, conver or my presentation, I'll turn it back over to Spencer. He'll talk about how Okta really fits in the center of this. It's one piece of the puzzle. I'll give you a little bit more background on what we're trying to create. So in that data center, in those data centers are the legacy. We do have some cloud, we're multi-cloud today, so if you think about it, you know, we're somewhere in between that, that bottom left and the next bubble, for lack of a better term. Um, and we're trying to implement uh, an environment that enables the business. I have a term I always say, we, we want IT to get out of the way of the business. And in doing that, we want to make sure that we get out of the way, but we implement a platform that is self-service friendly, always available, secure, and something that they can start thinking with their fingers, right? Uh, you know, in the kickoff, it's interesting to hear companies talk about the, the development staff being the core resource, and, it, and I didn't realize, but I think uh, the guy from Twilo was saying um, in 2008 there was a big shift. When, and, the, and the companies that are winning realize the devs were, were really the resource that's going to take you to the future. That's what we're really trying to architect here. We're trying to implement uh, a platform that enables that. Uh, Self-service, enable them to think with their fingers, take a concept to, to delivery, minimal viable product in the shortest time window possible, not that six, eight, nine month time period that we have today, much shorter. Um, trying to get to that upper right hand corner. I'll say an API um, economy or architecture that is open, um, provides the connection points so that the developers don't have to do what I'll consider commodity services. They can jump right in and start developing business logic and not have to do everything that the platform should deliver it. This is probably where I'll spend the majority of the, the time. This is our, my, our way of trying to simplify what, what we're saying, what we're saying, change the architecture and transform IT. Um, and modernize everything. So the, it is truly modernize everything. So you'll hear people talk about, in the other presentations, they talk about, you know, are you cloud first strategy? Yes. Are you multi-cloud? Yes. Are you hybrid? Yes. Um, the, what we're trying to do is stitch that all together, because you're not going to get to a single platform, but stitch it all together with partners involved and products involved that simplifies all of that and gives you the capability to not necessarily worry so much about where it runs. It, it delivers the value to the developer on a real-time basis, and it should be based on their workload where it runs, not on a preference. Right? So that's the going in um, concept. So if you look at this slide, the most important thing on that slide is the value line. And my team, trust me, has asked me a couple of times to change that, the term, but I can't come up with anything better because, unfortunately, my entire team operates below the value line, and that doesn't feel so good. Um, but it, it, it has to be delivered. Think about under the value line is anything that doesn't add value to your customer on a daily basis, every time they touch it. A lot of organizations that are our age would argue that infrastructure, infrastructure like servers and provisioning storage and provisioning LUNs adds value because it's a necessary evil. It doesn't add value. There's never a case that a customer walks in a physician office and says, hey, are you running Linux in your, in your data center? It doesn't happen. They don't care. They just want service. So we're trying to get everything that we possibly can below that value line in a commodity service through partners and through very small teams internally that it enables. And this, you'll see how Okta fits in here. And the way to think about this is, you know, Nirvana would be where that value line is flat. You can see a very light blue line that's sort of jagged that goes up through there. The value is different at every uh, business capability where that value line lands. So you have to be both flexible enough to do the flexibility in a vertical capability delivery model for the business. Think of a business service as e-commerce or retail, right? You, you may want that value line to go very high in the stack, meaning that there's less, there's, there's more commodity and there's less differentiation, things like ERP and things like that. Or in e-commerce and retail, there's a lot of differentiation from customized code and what you're delivering to the consumer. So there's more value to be added above the line in that case, less underneath. And we give them it, package it up, and it's done. In every case, though, there's at least bare minimum um, below the value line. Think of things like in security, 
think, think of things like operational monitoring and the infrastructure deployment, right? Those, those are non-negotiable. When you provision your environment, you get them. So that's, again, where we're headed. The last thing I'd say on here is when you think about it, because I get a lot of questions on this, they're like, hold it, you're a data-driven company, you have a lot of data. Um, you're, you're saying it's, it, it's going to be a differentiator, but yet on my slide up here, there's data below the line, and it's commodity. It's because everybody has data. It's how you use it. In this scenario, data is a commodity. Collect everything, track everything, keep everything for your customer, and then the value is the analytics. What do you do with it? So create a platform that you can actually do analytics on top of and add value to the customer. So that's how we think about our architecture, and that's how we're talking about it across McKesson, and that's how we're trying to deploy it. If you notice, identity, it's above the value line, especially for us right now. This is a differentiator. We have more data on the medication being produced all the way into the patient's body and every hop in between. We have all that data. The, the goal would be is a platform and, and keying on the identity of that patient um, and identity of anything in that pipeline so that you can then create a healthier experience. We're not in the business of selling drugs. We distribute them. It's a necessary evil. We would like people not to have to buy drugs. We'd like to keep them out of the emergency rooms. Right? That sounds like it's uh, uh, an oxymoron, so to speak. That's actually our job, is to try with this data and make it a healthier lifestyle. Right? And that's what we're trying to reach out and touch the patients with. Um, but again, that's why identity is above that. And then you'll see custom development and everything out to the left-hand side. That's truly the platforms that we really want to deliver. That's the conversation around buy the applications, keep them core, um, that don't add value, and then customize outside of those. Don't customize within the core. This gives you just a, a real high level view of, this is the complexity, right? Again, I go back to, we were a decentralized federated model. Do this times like 50, because it was implemented different for each one. So you had access management, identity management, everything separate. Could be based on the BU, it could be based, our business units, all right. It could be based on the region, it could be based on the country, and then it could be based within that country on any of the BUs that are in those countries. So it was a very federated, complex model for us to solve when we started thinking about this. Then add in, we changed our model from a business perspective. We were very B2B centric, right? The, the pharmacists were our customers. So it's a B2B relationship. We're gonna go B2C. And we're gonna go B2B2C. So you have that complexity. And then obviously for the employee, Everything was in silos and somewhat um, decentralized and overly complex, overly engineered. So how do we get there? We started with, we obviously had to pick some partners, um, Okta being one of them, that fits the ecosystem. And I think Spencer touched on it. Okta, not only from a technology fits the ecosystem, but from a culture perspective. The company brings a culture to the table that is, I'll say, an engineering mindset, software engineering mindset, that stays in its core wheelhouse and delivers the products that we needed. So that was a very, uh, I'll say, a differentiator for us when we were doing the analysis on who to partner it with in this identity space, right? So we did that with everything, not just uh, identity. We did it in cloud services. We're doing it with, we're selling our data centers. We're doing a whole bunch of other stuff underneath there. Right? So we're looking for partners actively, signing on partners in this space. Not from a, I'll say, outsourcing uh, arrangement, but from a partnership perspective. Help us get to the right side of this page. Because once we pass through, and I know it says cloud, it's a hybrid cloud architecture. Once we pass through from the left to the right, all that other stuff, if you were putting the value line on this, that value line would be right in between the run the cloud and the innovate on the cloud because everything to the left becomes the commodity again. And we just get that. And we want to get the teams all focused on the innovation. And that's innovation within the technology teams, but also mainly innovation on the product teams, rolling it out to the consumers. With that, this is my transition slide. It's the last one that really looks like a little bit of an architecture slide and a little bit of technology, but it's really going to transition over back to uh, Spencer to talk about, okay, so how does Octave really fit into this whole ecosystem that we're talking about? And what does it solve for us? And a couple of our use cases, and then I think we'll open it up for 
a bit of Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to quickly revert to this piece around what are the problems that we can solve if we crack the identity nut. And, uh, and actually, rather than refer to the slide, I'm just going to talk a little bit off script. So traditionally, you know, we viewed identity as the time, you know, some enrollment process has occurred, and that's usually, you know, filling out a form, start a life cycle to, you know, disengagement or, or you know, or deletion of that record. You know, I think when we think about Okta and one of the attributes there is if you can crack the piece from earlier than that where you can tie a human to a machine and you saw some of those capabilities getting announced today and some existed uh, already, uh, then from a security perspective certainly, but also from a trust perspective in terms of are you feeding the analytics or the, you know, the black box really reliable, trustworthy data to uh, actually arrive at those some consumer or patient sentiments piece. If you achieve that first step very well, then that's really, really important. Now, Okta's offering some of that today. The other component is with their open system and their partner network, you know, if you want to really take that capability further, that first enrollment piece, uh, then you can kind of plug in uh, these different pieces at a point of time when you need them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you think about the problem to solve, I'll give you two examples, right? And obviously, you know, European, British, uh, I guess British now, now we're about to exit Europe. But, um, you know, the experience is, bad experience is both sides of the pond, right? So in Europe, you'd be sitting there potentially, on my experience is, eight, nine hours before you get treated, right? That's maybe the bad side of, of some of those health systems. And then on the US side, I mean, my experience, every time you touch the healthcare system, you're filling out around about 15 different forms. Goodness knows what I'm signing. So imagine if you crack the identity nut in relation to uh, insights. So in Europe, I'd be sitting there, maybe with a innocuous kind of benign kind of symptom, but waiting to get treated. And with that health system, knowing my health record in a very detailed level and, you know, in various touch points, they'd be able to say, yeah, that's a fairly innocent symptom, but there's an underlying issue there that makes sense a case that we should treat immediately, right? That's, that's that example. In North America, maybe you don't need to fill out the 15 forms because it's a trusted identity that, again, has kind of been shared as a common interest or attribute across those different touch points in healthcare. So I just want to kind of frame why identity, just in our business, is really, really a powerful thing to, to solve. So when we think about, you know, the McKesson and Okta cloud integration and the journey that uh, Andy uh, spoke about as we evolve, you know, we kind of think of it from a, you know, learn, deploy, grow, and adopt and you know different kind of uh, capabilities and attributes of, of, of the Okta platform. Uh, but basically, if we think about partnering with Okta, you know, one of the main things that we thought about, and uh, I cast my mind back to kind of 2009, 2010, when I first started engaging with the company and speaking to the founders, and I think it's true today. Firstly, you know, is this a company where you feel by you feel like you're going to have a partnership, and doesn't matter how big they are, they still feel like you're working with a small company, and that culture is pervasive. And you know, do we aspire to have that culture in a 185-year-old company? I think Andy and I both agree that we do. Uh, you know, and the role of kind of developer and innovator is going to become bigger in our organization. So, should we? I think yes, we should align to a company that has some of those core values. Uh, the second thing, you know, around deployment is, do we see the technology seamlessly deployed and actually, you know, able to describe or create a narrative that, that describes a much better world than the one we exist in today? So that narrative is going to be different, however we kind of pr uh, present it to the, to the business. But from an IT perspective, you know, less legacy that we need to really get, be concerned about, or at least legacy that we can manage through access control. And then from consumer expect, uh, perspective, you know, some of that enablement that I talked about with the two examples uh, and the creation of trust and resilience and reliability. Um, and then in terms of growth, you know, will this be a company that will be around to, to evolve and, and rapidly innovate their, their product offering as our business evolves and, and, and matures and, and, and moves in the direction that we want to take it? So I think, you know, from a stack, very simplified view, but when I think about the different layers, you know, we're going to be, and Andy articulated the value line very important, but uh, very well, but uh, from a consumable perspective, you know, rich APIs and the fact that we can create this tapestry that we can bolt in and attach capabilities and they might look different, maybe on a month-to-month -month basis is super important. So ease, we, talk, we heard about the product offering around hooks, I think that's really exciting. So anything where we can make the management of the API environment a lot simpler is, is really good. 
The second thing from, uh, you know, kind of frameworks and development platform, you know, as a CISO, I can spend all my time chasing down millions of vulnerabilities, or I can create a really good uh, CICD platform that has got all the guardrails in place, but doesn't feel like, uh, you know, security is imposing or creating, you know, developers with an unmanageable set of rules that they need to engage in. We're just going to create an environment that feels very seamless and that they can develop safe and secure and compliant products uh, without a lot of effort, a lot of distraction from what they're good at, which is, you know, obviously developing really um, sticky um, consumable products. And then out the box workflows, I mean, they, we actually wrote this before the announcement this morning, so that's pretty cool, right? So we don't, you know, coding's important in our business, we do code, but it, wonderful if we can create kind of modules that we can just drag and drop and accelerate that uh, development pipeline. And then just sitting on this foundation of, you know, really for me, if I think about the security mission, it's kind of a stool with three legs. It's, you know, one is, uh, can we keep the companies um, illegal, you know, from a reg regulatory perspective? Uh, are we satisfying all regulatory requirements? And then, you know, if we look at Okta as a platform, that's kind of coming out of the box in terms of the technology. Uh, the second leg is really around from a peer perspective and a risk perspective, are we doing at least what the best of our customers and partners are doing from a B2B perspective and keeping us secure, their data secure, their services secure. And then the third component, which is really here, is are we uh, advancing um, security to a new level that's not necessarily traditional, it's really what's happening behind the curtain with all those insights that we're getting through the identity management end to end is, you know, what, what's looking like it's anomalous, what's looking like it's bad, and how can we uh, interdict that and actually prevent that risk actually manifesting itself across the environment. I'll give you one practical example. So if we think about a legacy infrastructure with servers and the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vulnerabilities, um, we try and patch and maintain that, but we're talking about a transformation where we're investing in the cloud. So we're not gonna swap out that environment. It's very expensive to prevent that, you know, to keep it up to date and in some cases not even supported systems or infrastructure. So wouldn't it be better to actually think about, well, what's touching that and what's the risk of whatever is touching that uh, server and the data and actually be much better at managing the identity and that, that ecosystem. So I think if we think about segmenting or controlling that environment without overly investing in something that's deprecating or dying is, you know, controlling the access and understanding what those uh, personas and touch points are and actually, you know, reducing them down to, you know, what's really required and then having strong you know, effectively monitoring capabilities, again, that can happen in the background uh, is, is super important. Um, so Andy explained, you know, we've early on in our, you know, adoption of Okta, uh, but, you know, first step is make that conscious decision and visualize what you want to be in a number of years, you know, maybe five years and actually start that journey. So this is where we're kind of moving from and to. Um, you know, we're addressing the fragmented identity, but where we want to be eventually is this very strong analytical component and how do we drive insights from the business with Okta and a number of tools we have. And I think, you know, if I think about the security capabilities, uh, as well as protecting the company and working below the line, as Andy described, we're actually exposed to some really, really valuable insights that can feed into, you know, uh, some of our uh, offerings for the business about how either the workforce is using applications and tools, but increasingly with that single identity that's agnostic to whatever persona you have, is being able to create business insights to, to drive revenue and, and create really good experiences for the consumer and patient as well. Uh, I think I touched on this, but this is a little bit of a site of, uh, you know, our, our uh, desperate identity stack as it uh, has existed in the past and how we're trying to shrink it and really just create this one view end-to-end -end with that extended piece and the enrollment at the beginning and being able to, you know, plug in these different uh, partners and capabilities from the ecosystem. Um, so we really just want to think about the transformation that Andy described rather than an evolution and what Andy's focused on and what I need to support from a security perspective is how do I kind of get out of the way of that transformation and how do we build that world very rapidly so that we can move over rather than evolve to it. So we don't have all the time in the world to you know, shut down our data centers and consolidate that old business. We need to move very rapidly, but also deal with those three pieces. You know, so trust, risk, assurance, 
and compliance. And I think you know that when we came to that decision, it was half of it was around the culture of the company that we're going to partner with, and do we aspire to kind of act and behave like that from a technology company perspective? And then secondly, are just the fundamentals in place there that really look different from the way that we've done security in the past. And I think for those, tick both boxes. Andy, anything you want to add there? Yeah, that's pile on. I think, I think it really clearly articulated. One thing I would point out here, right, I don't know if it jumps out of the slide. This is the complexity that we're talking about, right? All of those are different, either products or properties of McKesson. So you have Celestio, which is really the retail of the EU. Um, in 12 different countries, so it looks like one bubble there. That's what the, the background is all about. It's really 12 different countries um, and 12 different solutions independently managed um, by a country head, and then, like I say, the BU's underneath there. So this is actually simplified <laughs> a version of the complexity that it's trying to represent. Good. So on that, Lindsay, I think we're, we're going to open it up to questions or... Yeah. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, before we do that, I've got a few questions to ask you guys Terrific. Um, yeah. before we open it up to the audience. So you guys out there, start thinking of the questions you want to ask Andy and Spencer. Um, in the meantime, looking at this slide, there's brands and then there's brands and countries within these brands that you all had to convince to go on this digital transformation. I'm curious if during this process it was difficult to convince any of these brands or any of these distinct business units to go on this digital journey with you guys? And if so, how did you go about doing that? Yeah. Sorry, Andy. No, uh, no I was going to say, <laughs> you know, the thing to stress there is these, these businesses and businesses within businesses and geographies within businesses all really think and act very differently. So I'll pick one, like Cover My Meds is a business that we recently acquired, very, very startup environment, very forward modern thinking, wants to use all the latest and greatest tools and technology and probably thinking, you know, kind of three to five years ahead. We have traditional parts of our business that have a much stronger uh, reliance on kind of sustainability of the existing model, uh, business model. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, distribution, uh, which has actually gone through, you know, a number of years of modernization and automation, et cetera. So it's kind of addressed that already. They think really differently, right? So the what I'm saying is that when you go and present a capability, you have a kind of different narrative to each business. So for, you know, Cover My Meds business, it was, you know, more like, oh, great, that's something we recognize, something that, you know, meets the way that we operate. Uh, for the other businesses, it's a slightly different offering, right? You know, we think about, you know, if you're worried about resilience and sustainability, let's apply the security attributes of Okta and make sure that maybe your critical infrastructure stays up and protected at all times and you know who's accessing that. And perhaps there's some additional benefits around um, you know, optimization of, uh, of either workflows or, or industrial processes that are supported by the insights that Okta's gonna give us. Awesome, anything to add? Just, just to add to that, if you go back to like the, the value line slide, right? Um, presenting the transformation to our executive team and then out to the businesses, you know, we spent a lot of time putting a lot of PowerPoint together um, and spent 90% of the time on that one slide. And having the business heads sit there and understand what should be and shouldn't be below that value line was a key differentiator in the conversation for us. And, and it makes the conversation a lot easier because to Spencer's point, Cover My Meds is like, yeah, we don't wanna do that. So do it for us, just give it to us. They're a tech forward thinking tech version of our, our portion of the company. Some of the uh, legacy is more like, well, no, I've done that all along, so just give me a portion of that below the line, and I'll still do the rest. And then as we earn the seat at the table, we take over more and more services, and they start leveraging. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a journey with each one of them, and to Spencer's point, it's a little different conversation with everyone. Yeah, awesome. There's, Lindsay, I want to point out one important point. So you'll see, like, Novartis, and we, you know, we have, like, uh, biopharmaceutical companies that, that work with us on the manufacturing side. Uh, so when you think about Okta, I don't think it's enough for you know, modern technology companies just to create an open stack ecosystem, right? You, you've got to create a technology where partners and, and capabilities are attracted to that platform uh, so that they're thinking about how they develop their product services mm -hmm. within the context of something like Okta, right? And so when I think about all the third parties that we deal with and what they're doing from their you know, solutions and development uh, and products and services, you know, by adopting a very neutral kind of capability like Okta that they're being pulled to and want to be part of that sandbox. Mm -hmm. I think there's a huge benefit in relation to that. Great. 
Great to hear. Um, and other question, which I can't avoid asking, given I have a CISO and a CTO up here, how do you guys think about balancing user, use, usability and security as you go upon this journey? It's all about the experience. <laughs> he worries about security. Um, it, so to, to, the way I, I think of it um, is it's a bit of a shift left for us, right? Right now, um, it's, it's a, a progress, or we're in progress of shifting the responsibility from sort of after the fact, for lack of a better term, to shift the left down where the developers have everything. And I mentioned there's non-negotiables. It gets provisioned in their environment. It, that doesn't mean there's a toolkit down there that's doing it all. It gets the developers to write more secure code, mm -hmm. right, and give them the toolkits to do that and deliver them a, as a service, things like identity, and they get to pull that down, and it's already built in and inherent to the product itself, plus the way we want them to write their code. So it's a bit of a shift left in the mentality. So instead of doing code scans and everything else at the back end, it's just built into the product itself. Yeah, I mean, my, as I said earlier, my, my role really is to make Andy successful and make the company <laughs> successful and do as much as I can. It doesn't feel that way. No, I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get there, Andy. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we, you know, most of what I do has got to happen behind the curtains, and every time we kind of touch the business, it's got to be really meaningful, and hopefully it doesn't happen very often, and uh, whether it's for the consumer or even our own employees, right? Uh, there's a kind of balance between creating awareness around risk and cyber, and, and then, you know, what you should be doing, uh, as I say, kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a whole debate around, you know, the value of all that awareness. Um, but I think you need to balance those two things very appropriately. People are always going to uh, click emails with, you know, phishing attachments. That's always going to happen. But what can we do in the background that's going to kind of protect, protect that risk? And what do we know about that individual from an identity perspective? Awesome. Sounds great. And one last question. I thought it was really interesting. Um, you guys mentioned cultural fit with Okta a number of times throughout this presentation. Um, I'm curious if that's a criteria that you apply to other software vendors that you evaluate, and if, if yes, why is that, and if no, why is it so important for an identity solution? I think, you know, I'll steal some of Spencer's terms from uh, prior presentations. Culture is difficult to change, right, and, and mm -hmm. trying to do it on your own is really almost impossible, and do it from within, so the answer is yes, um, and we're picking a very small group of partners um, and that's weighing very heavily. I think when, when I came to McKesson three years ago, the, the analysis was like 80% done on ROI. Mm -hmm. um, and we flipped that now. Now it's feature, um, experience, roadmap, culture, and then there's this last line down there that still talks about the ROI. You still have to have a positive ROI, mm -hmm. but it's not the area of focus now, and culture outweighs that. Yeah, I agree. It's all about behaviors, and I think, you know, um, I'm just going to pick on one little piece, right? If we think about talent management, uh, look at all the energy that goes into hiring talent, right? Tons of energy. Uh, look how much energy goes into retaining someone that's thinking about leaving a company. Uh, the point there is, you know, to keep people motivated and on board with the mission, you kind of have to, you know, pay them well, obviously, give them a nice work environment, but then also give them the tools and technology that really releases their creative creativity or releases, releases their magic, however you wanted to kind of describe it. And, uh, you know, by picking platforms like Okta that just, you know, from a development perspective or from user perspective or just from a show back to employees, it's, uh, it's got to be something that feels good as an experience and something you feel like is a generational leap forward, right? Not, not just this slow evolution that, that I talked about before, that's painful. Yeah, it's really, really important. All right, and I want to open it up to the audience. Do you guys have any questions out there? I think Arlene will come run a microphone up to you if you want to wait a second. All right, we're going to go, I'll start on this side and then we'll take a question over there. I would like to remind everyone, please fill out your survey, take a quick moment. Uh, to fill out your survey, and then we will also um, be sure to try to get as many people as we can. Uh, speak into the microphone, be being recorded, so we want to get your really excellent question, and they're good at answers to uh, um, I'm familiar with McKesson and how you guys have purchased a number of companies over the years. How do you go about negotiating um, when you go into a new company uh, between Okta, Azure, how do you communicate those? Because in my management team, 
Um, half of the, my leadership supports Azure AD, half of it supports Okta. I'm trying to push everyone to Okta, but I'm not like at the top of the leadership ladder like you guys way up here, I'm kind of middle management. <laughs> You know, how do you do that when you go on to new companies every year? Do you just tell them this is what we're going to do, or do you negotiate that? How do you do that? Uh, yeah, until, until recently, it's been, um, I'll say, a, a hands-off approach where that's why we ended up with this, right? Um, let them run on their own, their, their own entity, up to and including it's in some of the contracts, so we left that happen. Um, going forward, where we are today is a different conversation. We're showing that, that again, it's below that value line. So I get it, that's what you're on, but we have to come to the table and make it easy for them to come over, hmm. right? So there is this, you know, it's just not about getting them on Okta, it is creating, a, I'll say that API layer, the integration layer, where we can start presenting some common services to them that makes it a lot easier to integrate them in and present Okta to them as a service and bring them on board as we go forward. The, the approach we're using is in our M&A office is having that conversation way up front now. And what are the non-negotiables? Security is non-negotiable. So as we build identity into it, it's a non-negotiable. For us to secure McKesson, these are the non-negotiables, and it sits at that layer. Some of the network monitoring and network um, um, standardization is non-negotiables. We roll that in now. So it, it's just now shifting, but until probably 18 months ago, it was hands-off, and it was really just trying to connect it. And we're seeing that that cost of integration by just trying to connect it's far out far out numbers, meaning much more costly than bringing them onto a common platform. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, it's interesting, right, you know, in these, you know, whether it's holding company or company of many companies, you know, we're all, they're all independent companies until, for example, we have a security issue, then suddenly we're one company, right, and you're answering as a company. <laughs> um, so, you know, to Andy's point, just to build on that, I think, you know, uh, your company is either a mandated driven organization whereby you can you know create this architecture capabilities architecture and technical architecture and just say look this is this is the way it is or it's a it's one around persuasion compelling case right so one technique is you know you have your architectural blueprint uh, the core services or platform services create all these offerings and capabilities and you know maybe the business doesn't want to be in that below the line position so they're going to say we're on board, but we need two years to do it, right? And then it's just a discussion at the executive team level with the CTO, CIO, and just say, does that feel like it's fast enough? And what can we do in the meantime to manage that complexity? And actually, how should that be costed out, right? If we created the capability, is it our cost or should it be allocated to that business unit? There are many carrots and sticks that you can use, but it really depends on, you know, what does the CEO or the executive team say about, you know, reducing cost, complexity, uh, while at the same time, um, you know, preserving the independent business unit kind of culture that exists in a, a business of many businesses. All right. Yeah, we have time for one more. Go ahead. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the user experience across applications? Are there a lot of users that flow and utilize lots of these applications? And what does that feel like to them? How do you make it feel like something holistic when it's really multiple applications with, with different brands, too? Today, the experience is you're dealing with almost a different company each time. Um, even if you don't look at this slide and you just take med surge versus med medical surgical versus U.S. pharma versus specialty health, it's three different experiences under the, the top BUs, right, um, under McKesson. So we do want to create that, that seamless, frictionless one experience um, and allow it to be branded differently. Right, because we don't want to lose any of the good. We, you know, we own Rexall in Canada, right? So it's basically the CVS of Canada, so to speak. But we don't want to lose that. It's got a good brand and everything in there. Will we ever rebrand it? Who knows? But we want to have the capability to, to leave that brand on there. But it should be the same frictionless experience. Yeah. I, I totally Andy. agree, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andy Spencer. Thank you. Great Thanks. to hear, hear more about your strategy.